Hello and welcome to Fast Forward, where we have ongoing conversations about living in the future. I'm Dan Costa, Editor-in-Chief of PCMag.com, and today we're going to talk about algorithms. Now, algorithms determine a huge amount about the way we live and work online. It determines what we see online, what kind of content we're recommended. It can tell us what type of healthcare we're going to get. And today we're going to talk about algorithms with my guest, Michael Kearns. Michael, thanks for coming on the show. Thanks for having me. I appreciate it. So you are a professor of computer and information science at the University of Pennsylvania, and you've written a book called The Ethical Algorithm, The Science of Socially Aware Algorithm Design with co-author uh, Aaron Roth, also at the University of Pennsylvania. And it really presents a framework for how we can build moral machines that will actually adhere to the sort of ethical guidelines that we, that we aspire to. How do you, uh, let's start with like, first of all, why algorithms are important, um, what we mean when we say algorithm in terms of AI, and like what people don't realize about algorithms themselves. Yeah, I mean, uh, so first of all, algorithms, of course, have been around for a very, very long time, um, since before there were computers, actually. Um, and AI and machine learning are also very old fields. Um, but I think what's really changed in the last 20 years, and especially the last 10, is that AI and machine learning used to be used in kind of scientific applications, because that's where there was sufficient data to train predictive models. Um, and the rise of the consumer internet has now made all of us kind of generate um, reams and reams of data about our activities, our locations, our preferences, our hopes, our fears, etc. And so now it's possible to use machine learning to personalize algorithmic decision making. Um, some decisions that we know about and want algorithms to be making for us and sometimes decisions that we aren't even aware of. So what are some, what are some of the ones that people may not be aware of? Um, so um, many of the examples in our book are kind of decisions where um, the decision has a great consequence for the individual um, and they may not even be aware that algorithms are being used or are being used to help the decision making process. So examples would be things like consumer lending, like whether you get a loan or a credit card when you apply for it things like college admissions decisions, things like hiring decisions in HR departments, and even very consequential things like um, health care, and also um, what criminal sentence you receive or whether you get parole if you've been incarcerated. So I think one of the problems with, um, most people don't realize this is happening, but it, it is happening in a, both private businesses and in government. Um, what is the, uh, you know, and ideally these things are being introduced to make the decision process better and more informed and less biased. Um, why isn't that happening? Well, so, so actually I don't think that the primary goal of most algorithmic decision making is to make things less biased. It's often to make it more efficient mm -hmm. and to take advantage of the fact that, you know, we have um, massive amounts of data that can be used to build predictive models. So rather than you know, either human beings directly making the decisions, um, which can often be slow and also be biased in various ways. Um, it's kind of easier and expedient to take the data that you have and to essentially, you know, train a model. It's really a form of self-programming, right? Rather than a computer programmer saying like, well, you know, who should get a loan and who shouldn't based on the attributes entered into a loan application, you just take a bunch of historical data about people you gave loans and who repaid and didn't repay, and you try to learn a model separating the credit worthy from the non-credit worthy. And so I think it, the, often in business and elsewhere, the primary driver is efficiency. Um, and our book is really about kind of the collateral damage that can come from chasing those efficiencies. So let's talk about some of those examples. Um, I think it was just a couple of weeks ago, there was a, a study that was put out about a large U.S. hospital. The hospital was not named, um, but it had a, saw a lot of patients, and they were using an algorithm to help determine um, who to give medical care to and how much medical care to give. And um, there was some analysis, and it was determined that, that the algorithm was systematically underserving African-American uh, patients and therefore over-serving uh, white patients. Yeah, and I think it actually wasn't one hospital, it was many hospitals that were all using some third party algorithm that had the problem you described. And that was a nice article. Um, and it highlights one of the several ways in which um, things like racial, gender, and other bias can creep into algorithms. That, in that particular case, the problem wasn't really with the algorithm, which is often a source of bias or discrimination. 
And it also wasn't with the data itself. It was actually what the objective the company used to, tra to train the model. And so the purpose of this model was to try to assess patients' health to decide what level of health care they needed or in to intervene with a treatment of some kind. But actually measuring somebody's health is a complicated, multi-dimensional thing. Um, so in other words, it's kind of hard to gather the right data to train for that goal. So what this company apparently did was say, like, well, let's just use healthcare cost as a proxy for healthcare. Let's sort of assume that in our historical data set, the people who had higher health expenses were the sicker ones, and the people with lower health expenses were, were the more healthy ones. And the problem with this is that it learned to discriminate against African Americans because they systematically, in the aggregate, had lower health care costs, but not because they were less sick, but because they had less access to health care. And so this is a classic example where, well, you know, you had one goal, it's hard to kind of target that goal or would require a more expensive data gathering process. And then they use this proxy, and that proxy essentially um, perpetuated this bias into their model. It's interesting because, it, you know, when you hear about a uh, you know, bias in the algorithm, you think that, well, certainly there is some point where you're asking about racial backgrounds. And this is a, that's actually very rarely the case. It's those secondary consequences, those correlations that you may not understand when you're first programming the algorithm. That's right. And in fact, I think one of the things we've learned in recent years that, you know, just because you don't include a variable like race or gender in your model is absolutely no guarantee at all that your model won't end up discriminating by race and by gender. And there's a number of reasons why this can happen. Um, and it's interesting because, for instance, in, in lending and credit, there are long-standing laws in the U.S. that say, you know, thou shalt not use race as an input to your predictive models. Mm -hmm. And, you know, in the era that these laws were developed, I think the intent was to protect racial minorities from discrimination by models. Um, but it happens nevertheless. And one of, one of the many reasons it can happen is that these days, especially when so much is known about us, there are so many sources of data about us that are available. There are just there are too many proxies for things like race. I, I mean, I don't you don't have to tell me what your race is for me to figure it out, at least in a statistical sense, from other sources of data. So you know, one unfortunate example is that in the United States, your zip code is already a rather good indicator of your race. Yeah. Um, so you know, this is the kind of thing that can happen. The, um, it's interesting that some of these pieces of data could be pretty innocuous on their own. Um, people don't think about Facebook likes as carrying a whole lot of data, but I think it was University of Berkeley uh, researchers studied 58,000 a set of 58,000 people's likes, and they were able to t identify their gender, their uh, race, their um, uh, sexual orientation all just from the things that they liked. Yeah, yeah, th that was actually not the Berkeley paper, it was an earlier one um, by, by some researchers at Cambridge University and Microsoft Research. Actually, w w that, that paper is interesting because both the result you describe, which is just from your like behavior on Facebook, I can predict things like whether you're the child of divorced parents, yeah, right? I, I okay. mean, it make, um, But also that, that the data set that they use for that is kind of a precursor to the Cambridge Analytica scandal that yeah. you know kind of rocked the 2016 election. So we'll t uh, talk about another uh, example of, uh, of a, a misunderstood um, algorithm. You talked about um, criminal risk assessment algorithms. Uh, and Compass is one of these algorithms that has been used for almost 20 years now. A lot of people have gone through the system. Uh, there have been some reports that, that, that there are flaws, uh, fairness problems in the algorithm. Um, but the issue is actually pretty complicated and nuanced. Yeah, so that was, a, again, a very you know, relatively recent um, controversy that I think um, helped advance our understanding of the challenges of algorithmic fairness. So um, you know, Compass uh, built this criminal recidivism prediction model, kind of a, almost a minority report type of model that tries, based on somebody's criminal history, to predict whether they will recidivate, essentially recommit a violent crime sometime in the next two years. And these kinds of risk assessment models are often used in different jurisdictions by judges that are deciding whether to give people parole or not. So it's very, very consequential stuff. And um, the uh, sort of investigatory nonprofit ProPublica took a hard look at this model 
and demonstrated that it had a systematic racial bias, that it was discriminating against African Americans and other racial minorities. And, uh, and so there was controversy and there was back and forth between ProPublica and the company that had developed the model. ProPublica saying, you know, your model is unfair. Um, and then um, North Point, which was the company that developed it, came back and said, no, we deliberately were aware of these issues and we made sure our model was fair, but we used this other definition of fairness. And if you dig into the weeds on this, both of these definitions of fairness are entirely reasonable and desirable. In fact, you'd like to have both of them. And so then researchers started scratching their heads and saying, okay, you know, who's right here? And then some of the more theoretically inclined ones kind of sat down and thought, hmm, is it even mathematically possible to satisfy both of these fairness definitions simultaneously? And then they, they proved that it was not. Mm -hmm. And so this is especially enlightening or disturbing, depending on your viewpoint, because it shows that the algorithmic study of fairness or, or you know, implementation of fairness is gonna be kind of messy. And that you might have to, you know, when you ask for one type of fairness, you may have to be giving up on another one. So let's talk about weeding into this messiness. I think we've been pretty clear about how complicated this gets very quickly. Um, so in your book, you, you offer some advice for how to build ethics into these algorithms from the start. How do we go about doing that? Yeah, I mean, so the, the main purpose of our book is, you know, it, 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 we are optimists, we are machine learning researchers, um, and, but we're also aware of, you know, the antisocial behavior that algorithms have you know, demonstrated in the past five years and the rising um, kind of popular alarm over that, and we share that alarm. Um, and we kind of felt like most of the books that we've read, many of which we've liked a great deal, um, are very good at pointing out what the problems are, but when it comes to solutions, their answers are of the form, we need better laws, we need better regulations, we need watchdog groups, we really have to keep an eye on this stuff. Mm -hmm. and, and we agree with all of that, but we think that you know, while that's going on, and you know, things like regulatory and legal solutions, they take a long time, right? Um, if algorithms are misbehaving, we could think about like, making the algorithms better in the first place. If we're worried about a criminal recidivism model um, demonstrating um, racial bias or an, another algorithm leaking private data, um, we could ask whether we could, you know, literally like change the code in those algorithms and eradicate or at least reduce those problems. And, you know, the good news from our perspective is that over the last 10 years or so, a growing number of researchers in the field, ourselves included, have been working on exactly how you would do that and what it would mean. And so the, the general kind of recipe, if you like, I don't think we're quite to the point where we can call it a recipe, but the general you know, um, process is you first, you, know, you, you kind of have to state what you're worried about, like privacy leakage or fairness or what have you. And then you need to, you know, anytime you're gonna explain something to a computer, anytime you're gonna put something in an algorithm, you have to be exceedingly precise. You kind of, you know, you can't wave your arms and say, hey, it's um, you know, try, to, try to be more fair, right? Yeah. So you need to pick like a definition of fairness that you could write down mathematically, and you need to sort of encode it, embed it in the algorithm itself. So to give a concrete example, um, you know, many of the problems of machine learning arise from the fact that it generally has a singular, very clear objective, which is minimizing error. So you take some historical training data, um, you know, you've got loan applications represented by a vector X, and you've got some outcome that you know happened historically, like this person did repay their loan or they did not repay their loan, okay? And what you would normally do is take a big pile of data like that and say like, okay, I want to, I want to use a machine learning algorithm to find a model, whether it's a decision tree, a neural network, what have you, that on this historical data set makes as few mistakes of predicting re loan repayment as possible. Okay, totally sensible principle. The problem is that, you know, especially when the model classes are extremely rich and complex, I didn't say anything in that statement about like, you know, fairness. So I didn't say, for instance, um, make sure that the false rejection rate on black people is not too much higher than it is on white people. I just said minimize the error overall. Mm -hmm. So 
um, if, for instance, black people are in the minority in my data set, or if there's some little corner of the model space where the overall error can be reduced just even infinitesimally at the great expense of racial discrimination, standard machine learning is gonna go for that corner, okay? So what's the fix? The fix broadly is to change the objective function and say, don't just minimize the error, minimize the error subject to the constraint that the you know, false rejection rate on black people and white people is no more than 1% or 5% or 10%. And this is giving you a knob also notice, right? You can, you, you can sort of say, I want perfect fairness, 0% discrepancy between different racial groups of false rejection. Or I can you know, relax that a little bit. Of course, if I turn that knob all the way to allowing 100% discrepancy in false rejection rates, it's like normal machine learning. It's like I'm not asking for any fairness at all. So, so I gotta imagine it's just so antithetical to most engineers' thinking, because you're basically going to sacrifice accuracy yeah. in, order to in, take, in order to accommodate these other principles which are a little more philosophical. Yeah, I, I don't think it's actually the scientists and engineers who have any difficulty with this. I mean, so first of all, they, you know, they understand the original principle of machine learning of just like minimize the error. They're, they're very used to solving constrained optimization problems also. So, you know, they certainly can understand the math behind this alternate where you're taking fairness into consideration. It's the CEO. The hard part <laughs> is the business, right? Because, you know, it really will mean you're going, it, it, will, it will mean, as you say, less accuracy, right? I, you know, it, if the most accurate model ignoring fairness was racially discriminatory, then getting rid of that discrimination can only make the error go up. And I think we're at the point where the science of these kinds of trade-offs is pretty well in hand. I mean, on actual data sets like the Compass criminal recidivism data set, you can actually literally numerically trace out the trade-off that you face between accuracy and fairness. Um, I think the hard part is explaining to non-quantitative people what that curve means, first of all. And then once they understand it, sort of saying to them like, okay, you need, to pick a you need to pick one point on this curve. You have to decide the, relevant, the, the you know, relative importance of accuracy and fairness. And remember, in many applications, accuracy translates into profits, for instance, mm -hmm. right? So if you are Google and Facebook, and you're using machine learning as they are to do targeted advertising to you know, your users on behalf of your customers, who are your advertisers, of course, mm -hmm. Um, if you decide to enforce, let's say, you want to make sure that in you know, um, ads for technology jobs are um, equ equally frequently targeted to relevant people of all racial and gender groups, you know, that's a constraint. And you might end up with a less accurate predictive model, meaning that your ad targeting's accuracy gets worse. And for those companies, that means like profitability re reduction. So I think you know, we're at the point where these conversations are starting to be had in large tech companies and other you know, areas like criminal sentencing, um, but it's, it is early days. What it, it also strikes me as complicated because like, what incentive does Google have to make its algorithms transparent enough so that people can understand how they work in the first place? Um, very good question. Um, you know, one answer that's I think a little bit off in the future but coming fast is they, they may soon face a different regulatory environment that puts more requirements of that form on them. Um, another of course is kind of market pressure. I think you know as people become more and more alarmed at the uses and kind of um, collateral side effects um, of machine learning and AI, these companies are going to be held more accountable um, and and so it might behoove them to be ahead of both regulatory scrutiny and their own users kind of demanding these things or perhaps migrating to potential competitors that are better on these social dimensions. So, um, and you know, I, I, I do think that broadly speaking, you know, the large tech companies have a lot of very valuable intellectual property that they are right to be protective of. But right now I think that they're kind of hiding more than they need to, right? So any time a question comes up about bias in Google search engine, and by bias I don't just mean racially, I mean like, you know, in, in sort of 
um, market pressure being exerted over what ads are being shown or what ads are not being shown. You know, their basic answer, in my opinion, is there's, the answer is comes on with the form like, hey, you know, we're scientists and engineers here, and we're using very principled methods to develop these predictive models. Um, you know, so, so bad things kind of can't be happening, you know, therefore trust us, okay? And I think, you know, the, the veil has been lifted from that now. We, you know, we realize that actually those scientific principles might be the very source of a lot of these problems. And so I, I do think there's a lot more room for the tech companies to be transparent without compromising their intellectual property. Um, and it, it's just a matter of there being enough pressure on them to, to feel that they, they'll do that. Well, is there a particular area of life that um, is dominated by algorithms that you think most people are just not aware of? I, I, yeah, I think, you know, again, um, just based on, you know, I'm kind of not out surveying the people in the street on their views and opinions on these things. So much of, much of what I glean is by looking at the popular media and deciding, well, you know, if they think, I mean, when you work in this field, um, one of the things that's kind of been especially interesting in the last 10 years is just what the media seems to find interesting, mm -hmm. right? And, you know, sometimes there'll be this article on which there's a big, you know, hubbub in the media, and everybody in the machine learning AI community would be like, you know, we've known this for 20 years. Like, why, why is this article in the New York Times or something, you know? Um, but, but it is, you know, it is a valuable indicator to what normal people find surprising, disturbing, or alarming about AI. And I, I do think that the, you know, I think people are generally, I mean, especially, you know, people that are, are heavy consumers of technology and technology products and services, I think they're largely aware of the fact that they are being surveyed, right? You know, that there are, their movements are being tracked. Um, I mean, you know, you, you can't imagine um, that your GPS isn't telling Uber where you are when you need to be picked up or Google Maps or yeah, Waze. In I fact, mean, you get so annoyed when, yeah. you're, when it's off by half that's a block. Right. Yeah, so, so I think people are quite aware that these devices are collecting this information and they can make the leap of inference that like, oh, well, if the device can do that when I want it to, it can probably do it when I'm not. I think the things that are more surprising to people are the things that kind of are um, these much more consequential applications that are kind of almost like back office functions, like criminal sentencing, and what level of health care you get, or what targeting is done for you in, in sort of personalized medicine, or hiring decisions, or college admissions deci decisions. I think um, people are still more of the belief that there's less automation there, and that there must be some you know, loan officer carefully considering your case. Um, and I don't think people realize how much of this these days is kind of entirely autonomous and, you know, no human is involved at all. This is, people always ask me, and I, I've just been giving some talks on big data, um, and I, people always ask in the, in the Q&A period, what can an individual do to take control in this situation? And I don't really have a good answer for them. Yeah, I don't have a good answer for them either. And um, you know, I used to feel I used to feel kind of guilty about that. Like, wow, I'm you know, you're you're in technology and computer science and AI. You should, and and then I, I felt much better about it when the you know a famous security expert named uh, Bruce Schneier, mm -hmm. who wrote he's run, written a number of books, including one called Data and Goliath, and it's a very good book about kind of how you know the internet advertising industry combined with government have essentially moved us towards a, something akin to a surveillance state. And then he has a section at the end of his book where he says like, okay, what can you do about this? And he kind of admits that even he, you know, it, 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 like the basic answer is go offline, yeah. right? Stop using technology. Um, and he, he, he admits, you know, he can't do that. You know, there's just like, he's, he tries to, you know, he tries to follow good practices um, like, you know, not ha having you know multiple obscure passwords different for every single service that he uses, um, which is a big pain. And you know, um, but but at the end of the day, he admits that these are um, kind of uh, you know they they shouldn't provide you much um, comfort at night. Um, so I think the longer term, so like I, I think the very problem right is that the is 
that we have to ask the question, what can each of us do as individuals, right? I think the right answer has to be um, you know, societal force on these companies to change their practices. Because the way the practices are right now, I think there's very little any one of us can do. They have to open up in terms of how they're operating and what they're using these tools for. Yeah, that's right. And I think they need to, I mean, I think the, the, the economic model needs to change or certainly be adjusted, right? I mean, it, it, it's a cliche, but it really is the case that for, you know, somehow the, inter the consumer internet developed where we all expect everything to be free. Mm -hmm. And the trade that we made for that with a, perhaps without realizing it or not or realizing it too late was that okay we'll make everything free but we're going to base it on advertising and other uses of your data including sometimes very intrusive data and there's a market for that we can use to pay for your free services and that's basically like the deal we collectively struck and I think at some, you know, I'm not saying, oh, there should be no advertising on the internet and, and everything should now be, you know, a hefty subscription-based economic model. I don't think that's the right extreme either. But we need something that nudges us away from the model that we're in right now economically. Are there any places where you think that AI and, and algorithms should be uh, prevented from going, that, that should remain within the purview of like an actual person making a decision? Yeah, I mean, e even in some of the, you know, um, areas where if you implemented it correctly and kind of adopted some of the solutions we described in the book, I do think, you know, there, there are certainly many, many areas where I, w even as a believer in technology and AI and machine learning, I would prefer there to be human oversight. Not, I'm not asking, like, you know, don't use data at all, don't use technology don't use AI and machine learning, but certainly like in my medical care, I prefer to talk to trained doctors and other professionals. I, I'm very happy to learn about the technology they use and, and it's always reassuring when they're using it and they clearly understand it and understand its limitations. So I wouldn't want that kind of thing to be automated. I think in other areas where you know, it's highly consequential, like criminal sentencing, so, so just to be clear, that, that is still not automated, right? These risk assessment models, they are inputs to judges who are taking other things into consideration. Um, and I think that's good. I don't think we should ever go to a point where, um, you know, decisions of that kind of impact are, you know, made without a human being looking at the material at all. Um, you know, more on the moral side of things, um, you know, we talk about this in the last chapter of the book, I, I do think that there are domains where um, even when algorithms can, can make more accurate decisions than human beings, um, you know, having an algorithm make the, make the decision fundamentally changes the nature of the decision. So I think like in automated warfare, um, the decision, you know, in like targeted drone strikes, for instance, um, so I, I'm not privy to the extent to which those are entirely automated or unmanned anymore. Um, but you know, I would even if you told me, oh, oh, we can do this much more accurately than having like a human being actually sort of you know remotely manning the drone. Um, you know, just I think there's a good argument for for the decision to like kill another human being. Um, we are wanting a human being to actually make that decision. Um, just because the human being has the capacity to feel kind of the moral weight mm -hmm. of that decision in, in, that an algorithm I, I don't believe can. Um, and, and so, the, you know, when you get to those kinds of extremes, I think, yeah, I definitely, again, I'm not saying don't have technolog technological aids, mm -hmm. but um, it, to me it feels like that's kind of crossing some sort of boundary. So I want to ask you some questions I ask everybody that comes on the show. Uh, is there a technology trend that concerns you the most, something that keeps you up at night? Yeah, I think we're kind of talking about yeah. them, yeah. Um, and I think our book is about them. Um, and, uh, you know, we're, we're Aaron and I, my co-author, um, you know, we're not, we're not kind of um, AI alarmists and, you know, we're kind of slightly bemused by parlor games like the Singularity and things mm -hmm. like that. And, you know, we do talk about it a little bit and, and talk about why we don't think that that's like a, something that we should all be spending a lot of time worrying about right now. But I do worry more about, you know, 
the kinds of things we talk about in the book, these sort of incremental um, side effects that many of us aren't even aware of. And even people in the field um, only in the last 10 years kind of realized, oh yeah, you know, it really might be that when you optimize for error, um, rather bad things could happen in certain applications. And, and so now it's kind of reassuring that we feel like there are, you know, there are the origins at least of a scientific discipline to think carefully about those kinds of problems. But, but now once you know about those problems, now you're kind of wondering like, okay, what else are we not thinking about? Um, and so, you know, in the immortal words of Donald Rumsfeld, it's the unknown unknowns that I think kind of worry me. I think there was actually, when you were, there is something to the, the nature of machine learning where, you know, we've got the, the example of the paperclip problem that AIs would be programmed to make paperclips and wipe out the human race in right. pursuit of paperclip manufacture. You know, that's obviously a little uh, hyperbolic, but there is this issue of, in, like, you know, if you pro the machine is programmed to do one thing to the exclusion of everything else, and sometimes what it'll exclude is fairness. Right, and, right, and right. The values that we care right, about. Right, right. And so I think, you know, um, I think the good news is that we have enough understanding of that now to sort of address it scientifically, you know, not exclusively. Again, I'm all in favor of better laws, regulations, and just general oversight. Um, but, but yeah, I think it's these you know, collateral side effects that are very hard to predict. And so we can think, you know, a good example would be you know, like, well, um, I can think about you know, making sure to not be discriminatory by gender, by race, et cetera, but then that might mean by asking for those things, I'm discriminating against some other attribute that I haven't thought about. Mm -hmm. um, and that can and will happen, and we need better ways of kind of discovering it quickly and dealing with it. Is there a uh, product or a service that you use every day that you can't live without? Um, I'm a big Wikipedia fan. I find myself you know, often educating myself and feeling like I'm getting reasonably accurate information, or at least it's clear when I'm not from Wikipedia, so I'm a, a big adherent. Do you edit and contribute as well as I, I uh, do consuming? not, I okay. do not, um, yeah. But I admire the people who do, especially the people who you know devote all of their free time to only correcting punctuation and grammar on Wikipedia. I think that's, you know, that is God's work. That's noble, <laughs> yeah. and it'll last forever. Yeah. Uh, thanks so much for coming on the show, I really appreciate it. Thank you, enjoyed the conversation. That's Fast Forward for today. If you want to see past episodes, you can find them on PCMag.com, Apple Podcasts, anywhere podcasts are given away for free. Thanks so much for joining us. I'll see you in the future.